Yes, I'll take a step back here, and uh, if you if you just opened up Ida and you want to get back to where you were, um, when Ida loads up, it shows you previous IDBs that you've loaded or EXEs. Uh, click on the IDB as opposed to the EXE. Um, if, if you come up with this, um, that that's going to open up your your actual Ida database. Whereas if you open up the the executable. Then it's going to load up a new a new copy of the, uh, the database. Um, in this case, it's actually because I had it from two different directories. But I'm gonna double click. You could just load previous, and you'd be you'd be set, right? Right. So in the view menu, we've got this. Function calls graph here, and you can see we've got just this tiny, tiny graph. If we zoom in, you can uh, get an idea of how the flow of this uh, this application, um, and you can see we've got start here, which is actually going to be our our entry point. And got this T main CRT startup, and eventually we've got main over here. Okay. So why is it that Ida uh, immediately went to the main function when there's all this other stuff happening? Up above main. Well, I don't recognize that this is uh, this is a, a application built with with the uh, standard C runtime um, using Visual Studio, and so it says all this code prior to main is just initialization. So it's code that. You should see every time you compile one of these applications with the options they use. Um, and it's stuff that you don't really need to bother with. You don't need to analyze everything above it. Now, it could be that uh, uh, an attacker might want to, for some reason, fool you into thinking that the, the code up above is the, the C runtime and kind of replicate some of its behavior. I suppose it's a possibility. Probably unlikely, um, but that, that's why Willie we uh, we start immediately in main because um, that's where the the user developed code began. So this is actually the old graphing feature of Ida. This is what they had prior to um, prior to adding the interactive graph. So you can fool around with this to, to look at the, the call graph and figure out what, what functions call what. Um, I think you may even be able to use this WinGraph32 to create your own graphs, but I have not done that. So. We left off with phase six. And I want to go over this a little bit, uh, and then I'm going to give you a little bit more time to work on it. So I'm going to go ahead and start fresh, because I've already done a bunch of work. Actually, what I'll do is I'll just ungroup everything. started with. Hide my note. 
Good. Okay. So I talked briefly yesterday about how to pick out these groups and how to collapse things down. Um, and I'd like to clarify how, how I do that. Um, so the goal is to start with the interior loops, okay? Um, when I when I look around this thing, one thing I notice is that this is the tail of the function here. And for some reason, my zoom went away. So I've got this return instruction now. If I look around the rest of the function. I don't see any other return instructions. So that is likely to be the, the, the end of the function and that there's no other way out other than calls to bomb explode. So I've got this loop here on, on the left side. Okay, I, I've already decided I've got this rat's nest. I want to collapse it down to something less complicated. So I'm going to isolate the loops that I know I can see plainly. Um, it's, it's just a single loop. There's no loop on the inside. So I'm going to choose these guys, collapse them down. And coming up with a name uh, initially is kind of arbitrary unless you've already analyzed the code. Uh, so you can just do them sequentially, group one, group two, group three. Uh, so I've got kind of a rat's nest again. And over here I can see I've got this loop and it looks like it's small. And I've got this top node, that's the beginning of the loop. I've got this node, which just flows into this one, so it doesn't create another loop. And this is the end of the loop here, so I'm going to group these guys. Okay. Now we've got a nice clean loop here on the left side, which actually includes my pre previous loop that I just defined here. So I can create a new group here. See things are starting to collapse down and get a little less cluttered. Got another one here. Now I always start with the, the the top of the of the loop. So I identify that by the the loop edge going into the node. So I've got this one on here on the right here. Just click. I know this group five is going to be the first section of code that we execute. Okay. And the rest of this is the tail of the function. I can see that eventually leads to the return return call here. Got a couple more loops. I've got this one on the side here. And if you notice, the edges are highlighted for where this thing goes to. So 
we want to go to the right side, that's where the loop is. And got one more loop. And lastly, I've got, I know that when I expand group five here. I'm going to have all this other stuff on the left here. So I'm going to go ahead and select all that. I'm going to call it tail. That gets that out of my way. So now I've got something that looks very simple. And I can focus now on, on the flow of the application from the beginning. So at this point, I'm going to expand this loop here. And the first thing, the thing I take note of is we've got this what I've called index, okay? Before I named it, it was called bar 8. And it's initialized here. So we see we move 0 into it, in, into it before this loop starts. And then the next block does a comparison on that bar 8. And that determines whether we continue in the loop or not. So that's going to be our index. And then I see the index is used, stored in EAX, used as, as an index. I told you about the base index and scale yesterday. Um, it's being, uh, being used as an index to whatever this local variable is. So um, some array. I don't know what it is yet. But I do know that it was passed to read six ints as the second argument. And we called that local var. Now, that actually turned out to be uh, our array. So our integer array. So when, when scanf ran, it took each piece of this array and used it to store the six different integers that we put into our string. So now I can call that int integer array. So that's our input array. And I, I first do a check, compare some item in the array to one. Is it less? If it's less, you'll see I, I jump over to this bomb explode here. We've got this green edge. Okay, so I know there. I know the bottom constraint. I know it has to be at least one. So each, uh, so each of my inputs has to be at least one. Okay, because this this occurs over the the entire array. Then, in this next block here, we have a comparison with six of our element, same one. And we have a jump less, e less than or equal. And if that fails, if it's not less than or equal, so it's greater, then we go to this bomb explode again. So now I know that each item in my list has to be greater than greater than equal to one or less than equal to six. So I've constrained what I'm actually going to try in my in my uh, bomb bomb lab here. So the next thing 
I notice this block here. So after we do our, our bound checking, we've got, we're moving the index into EDX, adding one to EDX, and then we're creating some new variable. And bar 40, so I'm going to highlight that. I'm going to uncollapse my bottom, bottom loop here. Highlight bar 40. And you can see within this loop we have an increment here. So this, I'd imagine, is another index. So typically when a very common convention is that people use i for an index. So when you reference an array, you have something like i array i. And you put that in a loop. And then when you have an interior loop, you do j and then k and l or whatever, whatever convention you like to use. Um, so I could name this J, name this other one I. But I'd like to see something a little bit more substantial than that. So I'm going to name it I, I, I. This is just a personal preference. But it helps you to pick it out, out of the crowd a little bit better. And we've got J here. So we've got two loops now. So we've got compare 
of j with 6. If it's, we're actually going to take the false branch if we want to stay in this interior loop here. Otherwise, we take this branch here on the right, and that's going to take us back up to the top of our first loop. So, if j is greater than or equal to 6, we don't do the loop, so we want j less than 6. And what do we check here? Move i into ECX, move j into EDX. Those are used as indexes into our array, our input array. So Pat, you know what we're comparing here? So we're comparing the two nodes. So we're comparing basically so we're like we're in one loop and we're comparing the thing that we're currently on to everything else. So we're comparing so basically we, we've got input array I and input array okay. We're doing if on nulls. And if they're equal, we actually continue. So in code, it's actually going to look like not equal. Isn't it a thing? Yeah. 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 They're supposed to be distinct. You're right. You're right. Because I thought, I thought the basic just was you have to have six unique entities. The idea is that, yes. So first of all, one to six are our constraints. It is one of our constraints, and the other constraint is that they have to be, uh, they have to be unique. <coughs> so we have to use all numbers one through six. Okay. So now we know what our input should look like, and we can collapse this whole left tree here, and then we're left with the tail of the function here. So at this point, I'm going to call this group 5, which is our first, first set of loops, constraints. And you could even go so far as to put pseudocode in there. You could actually type up this whole pseudocode. And then when you look at it, you know what that block does in some higher level language. Okay. And then we're going to end up in this. We got, we've got group 7 here. This is the first thing we're going to come to. And we see we're initializing i to 0. So we're probably going into another loop. So at this point, I'm going to let you guys start taking a look. Um, I recommend that you collapse all the stuff on the, on the left side that we just looked at. And that way, you'll have less clutter on the screen. Um, but have that, I'll give you until Say we'll spend 20 minutes and then we'll move on to. So the rest of the day, we're going to cover uh, the Windows API, um, how it's it's actually loaded into the program, how and there are multiple ways of doing this. And also, we're going to talk about uh, uh, classes and what what classes look like when they're compiled into some, or rather what, what, they're, what they look like when they're compiled and then disassembled. The idea is that there, there are attacks that rely on memory or a program being loaded in the same memory address all the time. Okay, so if you keep moving it around, that it makes it more difficult to, to, to locate. So it, it's called a return to libc. Attack. And it originally started on Unix systems. Um, the hacker knows that they can leverage some bit of code in the library um, to whether it's to load load their code into memory, um, 
maybe they hop around from place to place uh, trying to, ex to do something that will lead to their code being executed. Uh, so part, part of the reason they did this was uh, stack protections and heap protections prevented them from just loading up a buffer and then jumping into it. So these return to libc attacks, they leverage code that has execute, execute permissions and then they can find some way of getting to their code. So. Because of that, mine is based at a different address than yours. So back to what, you, what we were saying here. We've got this line of code here, move yeah. EAX plus 8 into ECX. Yes, that's what I'm looking at. And I'm pretty sure the line right above it is putting a, a, one of those list item structs into e, the start address of the okay. list item struct into EAX. You are right on. And so if I right click, uh, usually this is one of the quickest ways to see what, what options are available to you. Um, and you can see I've got the structure offset. Um, I believe if you hit the T key, you're going to be given this list. And this is what I showed yesterday. So and in that list, I'll choose list node.next. Now I have a little bit more context as to what's going on here. So I know that the next is being moved into ECX. Now, what can you tell me about this guy right here? So I was just looking at that. I think what you're doing is, so you you load the address of the, the current list of, of var 4, which is the list node, mm -hmm. into EDX. But then you treat that list node's first field as an address and load whatever's at that address in memory into EAX. OK. Is what I believe is happening there. And then you compare whatever was in EAX, whatever's in EAX after that load to whatever is in the first field of the next list item. You are right on the money. So what we've got here is we've got two different list nodes. Okay. First we've got a list node, we're putting it into EAX. Then we're getting its next pointer, putting it into ECX. <coughs> and then we're referencing something from that ECX. So, so this is where doing your, your context highlighting Using your context highlighting to, to help you understand where is uh, where is this thing that's being stored being used next. So we got got our list node. We're getting next out of it, putting that in ECX, and then ECX is used to get field zero, which is the first item in our list node. So some sort of integer, and we're comparing it with our previous item in the list. So we're just comparing consecutive items in the list. And then we're doing a jump greater than equal. And this is deciding whether or not the thing is going to blow up. So now you know when I was showing you the items in the list here, the first item is the value that determines whether or not the bomb blows up. Okay, for some in some way, this is the value of interest. Now the goal is to figure out what order they need to be in. I think because it's using greater or equal, it kind of narrows down the uh, the possibilities. Well, that's the list, and you gotta figure out how yeah. the list was built right. from the input, right? right? Which I haven't done yet. So you were saying? What I was saying was that because it's using greater or equal mm -hmm. and not equal to check for conditions, mm -hmm. it can narrow down some of the possibilities. So you can look at it as, okay, here's how many times through the loop it actually goes through. And try, and try to break it. Like, you know how you have a safe and you have, you know, your combo lock when you rotate the thing? Mm -hmm. You know, 
sometimes you can feel it when you, you got the right the first one or the second one. So that's what this you can treat that as that too. Well, and what we know here is that so greater than or equal. So if so if the first one is greater than or equal to the second one, we're going to take our our successful branch here. So what order does that mean they have to be in? So I've got the list has to go from smallest to largest. Has to go from smallest to largest. But that's the final list, of course. Yeah. Okay. It still begs the question: Will that work? So we can write a little. Well, I mean, here. because you're using your know, memory addresses and stuff, and you're manipulating those stuff is going to be scrambled. So you're just trying to figure. You can just do it by trial and error too. In the beginning. So this this loop, uh, we initialize i to zero. Okay, I set to zero and then it falls into here. And then we do a comparison greater than equal to five, we leave the loop. So we're once again going from zero to six, or sorry, zero to five. Greater than or equal. So just less than. So once we hit five, we won't get out of this loop. And that's because we're comparing two things together, right? And we get okay, so we've got our list over. But what was that? That comes from this node gets ECX, ECX gets R3C. So somewhere we have some head node to our list. So That's where we, we begin processing our, processing our list, so I'm going to call it head node. And you'll see it's manipulated somewhere over here. Okay. So we've got some sort of current, current node. And we're saying Next equals current next. Greater than we're going to explode. Greater than equal. Greater than or equal. Yeah. So. Wait, is that right? You were good either way. If it's greater than or equal, we're not going to explode. So if it's less than.
So Charles, yes. all this comparison we're doing at the end, where, where did this come from? <laughs> uh, where, where did these, uh, where, where did this field zero get set, or the next pointer get set for that matter? Um, previous loop, we were manipulating the array that we passed in with the structures that were embedded in the binary. So that field zero was coming from those structures. Okay, so at the beginning we had this, this structure array here. Yep. Put it in the head node. And you can see we use it down in this loop over here. So I'm going to collapse all this stuff. Oh, no, that's not what I want to do. So we're storing it in EDX, and then we're putting it into this a list node, which I actually, on the board here, called cur or current. So that's the current item that we're handling. It's a uh, just a point, and so we've got some sort of nested loop here. We've got we're setting i. We're checking to see if it's greater than or equal to six. If we do, we leave the loop. So a loop from zero zero to five, and an interior loop. And this time we set j to 1 instead of setting it to i plus 1. And our condition's a little different here, too. So our integer array was our input array. And we're taking i, which is the current iteration of the outside loop, using that to index our input array. And then we're going to compare that with j, our inner loop here. At this point, that's going to decide whether we, we do this loop on the right-hand side here. So. If it's greater than or equal, we're going we're gonna, to go over here. If it's less than, we're going to come to the right here. And it looks like we're actually put the current pointer into EAX, get it next pointer. And then we're putting that into the current pointer. So we're traversing the list. Okay, so we're, we're getting the next item. So basically, if we're, we're using our inputs to actually reorder that list that we got at the top right here. And in the end, we end up using this field zero and try to put these things into descending order. So one thing that would help me out here is, now I know my, my inputs have to be six integers, and they're going to be based on this field zero of these structures. Well, I'm probably not going to be typing OFD, and I'm going to be typing in an actual decimal integer. So we go to the structures window here, and we've got field zero, and I press H. Now field zero is base ten. So now I can see one of the items that I'm trying to order is two fifty three. If I click on its next, it takes me to the next item in the list here, but I haven't actually defined the structure. And you can see I Try to define a structure at this next item in the list. It doesn't actually give me the option of my list node. That's because we have something defined within this space. 
So we've got this double word defined here, and it's since our, our list is actually 12 bytes and I only, only have 8 bytes of free space, I can't define it. So, so is there a good way to undo an undefined? Because I accidentally <laughs> undefined something earlier and couldn't fix it. Uh, the, the best way, well, in some cir circumstances you can't actually um, undo it because it makes multiple changes. But the, the best way to do it is just to define it as whatever type it was prior to you defining it. So that, that is really the only way. There is okay. no undo. In, and whether or not that's changed in the latest version of IDA, I don't know. So what we need to do here is undefine this, this double word here. And go back to our, our next pointer. So if, if we got lost here, we can come back to, our, to the beginning here. Click on our structure. Click on the next node. And now we've got the beginning of the, this next item in the list. So now I'm going to right click, structure, and list node. And so 725. So what did you press to do that? Plus. So the number, uh, the number pad plus key will expand and minus will contract your list node. So you can see. Just keep on doing this. And we'll have all the items in the list. So we can we can keep going up here, but you're starting to see what order these are currently in. Okay. So who can tell me how we then choose our input? I think the, um, so as you're going through the numbers you choose, um, say that you choose one, it picks the first one, so the first at the bottom. And then if you choose two, it, it ticks, you know, 725, it picks three, it picks 301, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it counts which element, which element index of the new of that list you're going to go on when it makes the comparison at the end. Okay. Um Nick. Right. So So it seems like the what your input is specifying is what for it, each guy, what is the next guy in the list? So, if, uh, so we're, we're putting in six numbers from one to six, right? So in relation to this list, which you'll see it works backwards here. We've got this is the first one, second, third, fourth, this sixth. Each of our inputs corresponds to one of these items in the list, right? And we know we have to order them in which direction. Greatest to least. Yeah. 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 So. How did you do that list node thing again? So, you know, the, you know, list node is not a structure, right? So how do you get that? You, you don't have list node defined. No, I have list node defined. I'm talking about for the ones where it's have to undefined. That. You have to undefined. Okay, so you're saying you. Yeah. Okay. Like this. I'll do this again here. Okay. Um, I've been learning the hard way to define a list node at the top. T does not work. Structure. This does not OK, so. OK, now it helps. This makes, OK, that should make the test a lot easier six. now. What he's asking here is, so yeah. when I visited the first item in the list here, I've got the next pointer, OK? And it takes me to this address here. It's 
Uh, the last four numbers of the address are 45C8. Okay? And I see eight bytes that are undefined. Okay, and if I can select them and press U to be sure that they're definitely undefined. But then there's this double word that's defined here. And because of that, I can't define a 12 byte structure. There are only eight bytes of, of undefined items here, undefined bytes. So I'm going to undefine this double word. You do that using the U key. You click on the address, press U, it will undefine it. And then I come back to this 45C8, right click, structure, list node. And there we've got a list node, and it's collapsed. Okay. So at this point, I can order these things. So 997 is the biggest one, so that's going to be first. So I'm going to choose four. Right. And then, so put in four. The next one is 725. I'm going to put in two. And we've got 432. So next one, so six. We've got 301. Three. And we're left with one and five. You cannot have two numbers that are the same. Oh, you get four to three. <laughs> yes, it is. So. And that didn't work. Hmm. Worked for me. How worked for me? It worked yeah. for you. <coughs> Did you order. forget the new line? Yeah. Four two six three zero five. Okay. Now wait, wait. Did you try that? Oh, I did try that. Did you enter the previous uh, answer? From, uh, and it didn't work. I got three iterations. Do the last load. <coughs> Four two six three one five is the sixth line of input in the text file. Definitely worked for me. Yeah. Okay. So what's going on here now is I yeah. I originally started with the answers file and then I switched to using. It's worked before. We still haven't got the secret things. Ah. Okay. Uh, your answer is missing uh, the missing OA, one. the previous. Ah, yes, yes. That's my problem. So <laughs> I skipped step five on it. OK, and step five was the all cap. Yep. That's because I typed it in last time. Now, if I try this, congratulations, you diffused the bottom. So I understand some of that might have gone fast. Uh, we can come back to this, and you know I can work with you if, on, uh, on portions of that that might have moved too fast. Um, let's see here. Probably going to. Why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, on, yeah, work. It might have been a, I forgot to save or something. We'll get started on the, the next section. But are there, are there any questions before we move on? Any questions about uh, structures or organizing your code or uh, nested loops? Anything?